once again to the Explaining History podcast. Now, this is a continuation of the podcast that I did last week on Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, if you haven't listened to that one and you want to be up to speed on, on this podcast, maybe go back and give it a listen and, and come back to us. Okay, you're back. Brilliant. Great. So, the previous podcast we talked about the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti, two Italian anarchists who were, uh, it, fa- it was fairly likely falsely accused of murder and uh, robbery and uh, executed in 1927, largely because of the prejudices against uh, anarchist thinking in America. Now, I drew a lot of what I was saying from the essay um, The Men and the Symbols by Eric Foner, written in 1977. And Eric Foner goes on in the essay to talk in great depth about the roots of anarchism in America. But let's, before we do that, talk about in very, very broad terms what anarchism uh, actually is. Um, the, I, the, the idea that underpins anarchism is a scepticism and a rejection of power uh, itself, the structures of power, be that government, uh, the accumulation of wealth in in terms of capital, uh, or what have you. There are many... The reason why I don't want to nail down anarchism, and I'm making this very broad and nebulous, is because the way in which different anarchisms manifest themselves, and there are umpteen different variants of anarchism, all hinge around the solution to that um, scepticism. Some anarchisms uh, manifest themselves in a kind of hyper-individualism that actually is is quite compatible with the extreme forms of capitalism we see in the 21st century, Um, the very deeply mistrustful of states and bureaucracies, even though, irony of ironies, capitalism is absolutely dependent on uh, state assistance and state intervention and uh, state investment in innovation where um, entrepreneurs, risk takers, who actually kind of risk avoid as capital seeks to avoid risk as much as possible, um, won't tread and therefore the state has to step in and, and do things. I don't want to go down too far down that route. Then there is um, a, a more um, leftist anarchism, a, uh, an anarchism that's perhaps more compatible with Marxism, uh, a, uh, a, com- a communal uh, or communitarian Marxism uh, anarchism that sees uh, the ultimate society as being one or uh, one similar to the Mir, the, the the Russian peasant commune where the uh, society is self-governing and based on uh, communitarian and um, shared values. Um, So these are the the kind of... Anarchism is inherently utopian in, in its outlook and emerged in 19th century Europe by the from the observations of thinkers such as Bakunin and uh, Kropotkin, who saw something inherently benign in peasant life in Russia and Poland? They obviously didn't look too hard because peasant life in Russia and Poland was anything but. It was uh, short and violent and alcoholic and misogynistic and distinctly not libertarian uh, whatsoever. And the emergence of a Kulak class in Poland, in Russia, uh, in the 19th century uh, would suggest that the uh, Russian peasant has within his ranks innumerable capitalists. If anything, that kind of 19th century anarchism was a rejection of the, the dark satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution and an embrace of, an embrace of this kind of supposedly rural, bucolic, uh, idyllic lifestyle um, and that was viewed by the um, anarchists as being inherently less corrupted, more pure, more rarefied, uh, more uh, honest and there was some uh, inherently humanistic tradition of the collective that seemed to have passed through time. Whether people like Bakunin or Kropotkin knew this or not, the reality was that the Mir was not an ancient institution. The peasant collective was not age-old. It was a relatively modern thing, and it had been pioneered under the era of Catherine the Great, 
by uh, Potemkin and the of of the Potemkin village fame, and he had created the institutions um, of the Mir of the collective to enable a stable agricultural base in Russia. And this would allow um, a, a functioning society. And the view that many 19th century anarchists and also a kind of agrarian socialists in Russia had of this uh, purer, more innocent and more politically valid um, way of living was inherently a romantic one. And you see the same romanticism in Western Europe as the Industrial Revolution develops and the idea exists in the eyes of many romantic poets that there is something that society has lost, something uh, innocent, something rural, uh, something special in nature that society uh, has lost and some kind of return to that would be ideal. Eric Foner points out that in America in the 19th century and the early 20th century, there were two anarchistic traditions. He says, The United States had two distinct anarchist traditions. Native anarchism, symbolised by Emerson and Thoreau, and derived uh, and deriving from the distrust of government, so pervasive in the writings of Paine and Jefferson, was a form of extreme individualism. It was often coupled with pacifism or non-violence, and usually coexisted with a commitment to private property as the bulwark of individual freedom. Immigrant anarchism, associated first with Germans, then Italians, was, in contrast, a form of libertarian communism. As Errico Malatesta, the great Italian anarchist, put it, anarchy without socialism is impossible. The first kind of anarchism, this sort of homestead anarchism, perhaps you could call it, which uh, showed uh, an immense mistrust of the state and the uh, organs of state, is something that has existed throughout kind of the discourses of American um, history and political thought uh, ever since the founding of America, uh, right up until uh, the present day. If the question of freedom is one which has kind of defined America, this uh, nebulous notion of freedom, the the state either uh, either is a threat to freedom it inhibits fr uh, freedom or in the eyes of many it is a device by which freedoms are protected sort of it's the state is either freedom from or freedom to there are periods of 19th century american history where anarchism or a kind of anarchy an absence of the rule of the state has been uh, the norm or has been idealised. The expansion into the West, the colonisation of the Great Plains, essentially individuals, and or so the, the myth-making goes, individuals colonised the Great Plains and the West before states emerged. Well, states kind of emerged in the terms of territories and then actual states uh, alongside the expansion of uh, individuals. But the fantasy that has ex existed within uh, American political and cultural discourse is the fantasy of the uh, frontier where new civilizations were hewn from the soil, farms were settled, uh, villages and towns were built, and the settlers did this without the help or the connivance or the interference of state power. In fact, it's only in this rather buccaneering view of American history that when the state intervenes, the problems uh, inevitably emerge. American politicians have, uh, from the particularly from the 60s onwards, I'm thinking about Barry Goldwater and then obviously Ronald Reagan, have hijacked this spirit of the, the frontier, this memory of um, the taming of the West, in order to show that government spent expenditure must be curbed, that government is the problem, that government can't offer solutions, and that once the pioneering spirit of uh, everyday Americans is unbridled, is uh, unleashed, then there will be tremendous transformations in uh, America's fortunes. Unfortunately, in the case of both Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan, these uh, solutions 
were not based on a real understanding of uh, America's economic difficulties or geopolitical difficulties in the 1960s, 70s or 80s. No amount of uh, frontier spirit was going to change the fact that America was transitioning from being an economic surplus nation to a deficit nation and that America's um, position from 1945 as a global net producer of goods and services was starting to be challenged and then overturned by competitors such as Germany and Japan and therefore the transition from surplus to deficit meant that America had to cease being a manufacturer and instead become a banker of recycled euro and Japanese dollars and the way in which to do that is to hike up interest rates, destroy native industry, create a attractive place for uh, returns to be made on international finance and essentially usher in neoliberalism. Using of course the fantasy of the West to do it. If you're ever wondering why it is American presidents like to be seen wearing Stetsons, there is a, a very good reason why they do. The European anarchism that had come to the United States was a, a, of a very different variety. Um, Eric Foner writes, The millennial dream of Italian anarchism was a communal society in which the triad of old world evils, state, church and private property, had been abolished. More than, uh, more than in any other country, anarchists in Italy exalted the propaganda of the deed. Terrorism, sabotage and assassination were all considered legitimate ways to stir the masses to revolutionary fervour. Now this concept, the propaganda of the deed, is quite a, a complex one. Um, about five years ago, I did a podcast on Russian anarchists and the um, and the, the spate of assassinations in uh, the the uh, Tsarist Russia of Alexander the Second and Alexander the Third, you can probably still find it. I'm sure it's still uh, out there, but right at the the very bottom of of, of this archive. The belief, and it was a largely misguided one, that uh, anarchists from the uh, agrarian anarchists of the nineteenth century all the way up to the Red Brigades in Italy and Germany in the 1970s had, was that if they, uh, if they conducted a series of assassinations and bombings, then state repression of the working classes would ensue. The, the state would assume that uh, trade unions and other working class organisations were at fault and that they needed to be crushed. And in this crushing, uh, the masses would finally be roused, the scales would drop from their eyes, they would see the state for all the evil that it was, and rise up and overthrow it, and hey presto, you would have an anarchist utopia. Um, interestingly, this never happened. Instead, in most instances, when government ministers are assassinated, and when uh, there are bombs thrown under the carriages of everyone from... Uh, Louis, uh, Napoleon III in, uh, in France to the Kaiser in Germany and to the Tsars of Russia, most people react with horror. Working class people do not look at things uh, by and large in uh, simplistic political terms and think, uh, well, there is a class war being waged and I am on the recipient of the, the boot of the upper classes. They simply, as most human beings do, uh, look at arms and legs being blown off as being uh, horrific and, uh, and appalling. Now, the anarchists um, and their theorists did predict that there would be uh, resistance amongst the working classes to um, uh, propaganda through the deed. But they assumed that reaction would be the thing that would force the... Uh, the working classes into their arms. It's no coincidence that modern Islamist terror is modelled on 19th century anarchism in this way. The assumption of everyone from ISIS to Osama bin Laden was that uh, there would be a wave of anti-Islam sentiment in the Western world uh, following events such as 9-11 or the 7-7 bombings, and this would it's essentially show uh, Muslim people living in the West that they have nowhere else to go and they uh, should uh, 
uh, support uh, Al Qaeda or Islamic State or, or what have you. And again, uh, a largely false premise that it doesn't matter how many terrorist attacks uh, there have been. The vast majority of Muslims living in Western countries have not joined Islamic State or supported uh, whatsoever. And you only need to look at the mass demonstrations against Islamic State that have happened not just in Britain and America by um, uh, Western Muslim people, but also in Iraq itself. So there you go. But um, in Marx's writings, there was very little that anticipated the uh, existence of a working class that was actually loyal to uh, the, the organs of state or loyal to the institutions of state. Uh, Marx again assumed that over a long period of time the working classes would understand their oppression, would form the political parties of it and institutions, trade unions, revolutionary organisations that would overthrow capitalism um, and hey presto. He thought that it would take probably a lot longer uh, than uh, practitioners such as Lenin and uh, Trotsky imagined. And Marx also thought that there were certain countries, such as Russia for example, where it was important not to try socialism for a very long time. Instead it would have to wait till uh, Antonio Gramsci uh, in the 1930s to really explain why it was that working class people didn't flock to the banner of the revolution and he suggested there was such a thing as hegemony. He argued that hegemony are the ideas that the ruling classes inculcate on the, uh, on the poor. And he said that in democratic societies, uh, and in fact in most societies, it's impossible to rule through coercion alone. You can't simply just batter the poor into submission. Uh, there are too many of them. So what you have to do is incorporate them ideologically, into the uh, system, into the hierarchy of capitalism, or feudalism perhaps, by making them believe that their interests were aligned with the interests of the ruling class, and that they were in some way benefiting from the selling of their surplus labour value, um, the, the classic Marxist uh, theory of uh, labour exploitation. And Gramsci argued that with the, the modern mass media, this had been incredibly successful. So much so that real hegemony, a real hegemonic idea, is almost completely invisible. It's simply taken as common sense. The idea that capitalism and private property are the optimal ways of running society. For most people in capitalist societies, this is a complete and utter and challengeable given. Such is the idea also that there is, you know, a kind of a natural order to things, that class is inevitable, that private wealth is always earned and deserved. It's these ideas that Gramsci said really were the real glue that held capitalist society together. And it was these kinds of ideas that meant that the Italian anarchists that landed on uh, American soil uh, began to bring about their propaganda of the deed were going to be unsuccessful. Um, Eric Foner writes, Although anarchists comprised only a small part of the Italian left before World War I, through emigration they exerted a powerful influence on the anarchist movement abroad. Among the most important exponents of Italian anarchism was Luigi Galliani, the man Vanzetti acknowledges as our master. A brilliant propagandist and polemicist, Galliani preached a stern brand of anarcho-communism, rejecting any form of political organisation and advocating violent revolution and relentless war against capitalism. In his newspaper, Quanarca Sovasiva, uh, Galliani lionised uh, McKinley, President McKinley's assassin, uh, Zagolge, uh, as well as uh, Gattiano Bresci, uh, who had returned from Paterson, New Jersey, to assassinate King Umberto of Italy. During World War I, the federal government suppressed Galliani's newspaper when it urged Italians to resist the draft. Galliani himself was deported in May 1919, but not before he had called on his followers for violent revenge. Soon afterward, bombs exploded in eight cities, 
and an Italian was killed trying to place a bomb at Attorney General Palmer's uh, Washington home. And it was this bombing campaign that initiated uh, the Palmer raids, which saw uh, anarchists and socialists uh, arrested uh, across America. Ironically for Galliani, the champion of the working classes, it was Attorney General Palmer's maid who opened the bomb which blew her hands off. Now, it's known that in the case of Sacco and Vanzetti, there was a huge degree of media interest in the case and there was a huge degree of political activism uh, surrounding uh, Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, In Boston, writers and intellectuals campaign to save them both from the electric chair. The alumni of the American uh, liberal left, John Dewey, uh, Dorothy Parker, John Dos Passos, publicly protested against the sentence, hoping against hope that the men would be found innocent, but also hoping that at least the sentence could be commuted to a life sentence. However, as often happens in these cases, the uh, uh, intellectual class overestimated its importance and underestimated the extent to which it is resented by the rest of society. Um, The writer Granville Hicks wrote at the time, the battle was between the intellectuals and everybody else. The guilt of Sacco and Banzetti having been firmly established in the minds of the general public meant that the uh, intellectual support for Sacco and Banzetti clashed with another uh, tradition in uh, American culture, that of anti-elitism, the idea that uh, ivory tower intellectuals were simply speaking down to the morality of the uh, ordinary American and for some inexplicable reason were wanting to spare these dangerous foreign uh, terrorist types from the justice that uh, America had lined up for them. In fact, most of the money that was raised to defend Sacco and Vanzetti, um, $300,000, came from the Italian-American community, from small donations, and within the Italian-American community, because of the advent of fascism in Italy five years earlier, there was already a well-developed anti-fascist, uh, anti-fascist politics. For example, one of the uh, donors was the Liga Antifascista of Pittsburgh. And in m- the eyes of many Italian-Americans, the spectre of anti-Italian racism uh, was there in the case of Sacco and Vanzetti. The uh, assumption uh, in the eyes of many Italian-Americans, and it's probably a perfectly valid one, was that the view uh, of Italians were that they were uh, essentially knife-wielding Sicilian criminals uh, who vowed omerta, the vow of silence, and worked for some kind of uh, criminal backer. Or they were senseless political extremists who believed in ideas that are incompatible with being American. Whereas the reality is that Sacco and Vanzetti were poor immigrants who were easily exploitable and exploited initially for their labour, but then finally exploited for their judicial and political reasons and put to death because of their politics in a period of anti-communist, anti-socialist and anti-anarchist hysteria. Anyway, I hope you found that useful, and um, do remember, if you can, to give us a good write-up on the Explaining History iTunes page, and if you can support us on Patreon, that would be grand as well. Uh, Many thanks, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Bye-bye.